One thing is clear. We all have things that we desire from God. And although we know faith plays a very important role in receiving anything from God, many of us still have questions around this thing called faith. What kind of faith do we need to have? How, how much faith do we need to have? And what about doubt? If we have doubt, does that disqualify us from receiving anything from God? And then sometimes we have the unfortunate experience of unanswered prayers. We're going to explore some of these questions and topics in today's lesson. We are coming out of Mark chapter 9, where Jesus heals a little boy who's possessed by a demonic spirit. This demonic spirit is making the young man sick. This is a remarkable display of Jesus' power over demons. We've got an amazing lesson. I'm inviting you in. Let's see what God has for us. I want to take this time and welcome you to another episode of Just Teach. As always, if this is your first time visiting our channel, I want to extend a very heartfelt welcome to you. The theme here at Just Teach Ministries is Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, where it says that Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. That is our aim and goal here at Just Teach Ministries to seek, do, and teach the word and the will of God. We're asking you to help us out if you haven't already by clicking the thumbs up button in the bottom left hand corner of this video that helps us out with the YouTube algorithm. And if you haven't already, certainly click the notifications bell. Uh, I know that you're already subscribed to the channel, but when you click the notifications bell, that gives an indication to YouTube that they will alert you every time we upload a new video so that you can partake in all of this wonderful knowledge that God is pouring out through this ministry. Listen, we appreciate you as always. Do want to let you know that there are notes available with today's lesson. If you click the more button underneath this video, drop down appears. There's a, a blue hyperlink under the title lesson notes. You can click and download the notes. There's also a link to the Prezi presentation that I'm going to use for this recording. Both of those are my gifts to you. They are absolutely free. I just pray that they are an encouragement to you as you study the word of God. So listen, we are making our way quickly into today's lesson. We are continuing with the spring quarter of the Union Gospel Press Sunday School book. Over the quarter, we have been talking about the theme that Jesus is God. We have been proving the deity of Jesus, not just the fact that Jesus is the son of God, but that Jesus is in fact God. John chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. In this unit, we are talking about or proving the deity of Jesus through the miracles that Jesus performed on last week. We were in John chapter two, and we talked about the wedding of Cana. So if you didn't have an opportunity to watch that, I'm gonna link that video somewhere right here so that you can go in and enjoy that lesson as well. On this week, we are coming out of Mark chapter nine, and we are in verses 14 through 29, very powerful, prayerfully, a very familiar passage of scripture where Jesus cast an unclean spirit out of a little boy, and this unclean spirit was making him sick. Of course, all this came at the petition of his father. So let's do this. Let's dive into the lesson context. Let's establish a lesson background, and then we can begin to unpack the verses. What I have written here in the beginning, it says that Jesus and three disciples, the three disciples of the inner circle have returned from being atop Mount Hermon where Jesus changed his appearance, get this, in a way that is described as shining white as snow, the whitest on earth shine as the sun. We know this story. For those of us who are a little bit more familiar with scripture, you're familiar with this story that is hallmarked as Jesus on what's called the Mount of Transfiguration. It was literally Mount Hermon, but because of what Jesus did and the fact that he transfigured, he, he changed his appearance. And this appearance looked like something so uh, supernatural, so out of this earth that the, it can only be described by the gospel writers as something as a bright light, something that was so bright that they don't have an earthly reference for it. Uh, one of the translations, I believe it's ES, ESV, says that it was it was whiter than bleach could make anything. It was so it was white, white. <laughs> they didn't have bleach in biblical times, but they probably had some type of solvent that was a cleaner, but. Either way, 
Jesus appearance was so bright. And not only did Jesus transfigure, but we know that the uh, disciples also saw a manifestation of Moses and Elijah. So there's, there's a lot of dynamic spiritual activity that's taking place on top of this mountain. Uh, don't want to go into all the details of it. Uh, I simply want to do a very quick contrast of the mountaintop experience versus the valley experience, because what you have is you have these three disciples that are on top of the mountain. These This inner circle, Peter, James, and John, they are on the top of the mountain, but then you have the other nine disciples that are in the quote-unquote valley, and they are wrestling <laughs> with a demonic spirit, and they're, and they're wrestling with an antagonizing crowd, and what this, this image kind of paint is it image it's, it's a very clear illustration of the life of a believer in that we sometimes have mountaintop experiences and then sometimes we have valley experiences but the truth of the matter is is that both of them are needed and both of them are very critical to the christian experience it's i think what's important for us to understand is is what those mountaintop experiences are and what those valley experiences are identify them and then know how to utilize them in our lives. Because when you talk about mountaintop experiences, you're talking about seasons in your life when you are on a spiritual high or maybe even moments. They, they may have been a time in your life where you were engaging the fellowship of other Christian believers. You were in this place where you really felt ministered to in your spirit. You were gaining wisdom. You were gaining spiritual knowledge. You were really elevated in your faith. Usually this would happen. Maybe you went to a revival. Maybe you went to a church conference. Maybe you went to like a church convocation. You know, if, if you were like me and maybe you grew up going to Christian camp, maybe you had a week long experience when you just kind of were insulated with a bunch of like minded believers. You had good fellowship. You had good conversation. You were taught good word. You were preached to. You were in corporate worship and you had this mountaintop experience. And of course, in this experience, God reveals himself to you in a way that you've never seen before. That's exactly what these three disciples are experiencing. They're experiencing the mountaintop experience. And what we have to uh, understand as believers is how do you maintain a mountaintop experience or how do you glean and benefit from a mountaintop experience even when you're not on the mountaintop? Because the truth of the matter is you can't stay on the mountaintop. The mountaintop is where you see a revelation from God, but the valley is where you live life. The valley is where you have encounters with demonic warfare. But get this, the valley is where you work. It's where you do ministry. So it, the truth of the matter is, is that we go to the mountain to be energized and to be recharged. And then we go to the valley to work. So understand this. This, this is showing us a very clear dichotomy on how sometimes you go to the mountain, but you got to come down. And as soon as you come down from the mountain, you are immediately faced with an encounter with the enemy. You're immediately faced with a test. Now, please make no mistake. As we make it our way in today's lesson, I want you to understand this passage of scripture. It is about faith. Even though the title of today's lesson is Jesus' authority over demons, and of course, we're talking about the deed of Jesus. So we want to show how he demonstrated power, different, different types of supernatural power. We, we have to do this passage justice and understand that the main purpose of this text is to illustrate faith in what faith produces in our life. So understand Matthew 17 and 20, it says that if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to mountains... <laughs> No pun intended, right? Remove hence yonder place and it shall be removed and nothing shall be impossible. So what Jesus is showing us very clearly in Matthew 17 is like, yes, we, we need to have faith. But the but the the blessed and the graciousness is that it doesn't take much faith, faith the size of a mustard seed, and it can produce great results. Hebrew 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we certainly need faith. It is how we access God and how we get God's attention. So let's do this. Let's jump right into verse number 14. Let's begin to unpack this story. It says, and when he came, he being Jesus, when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway, all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed. They were running to him, saluted him. It says, and asked the scribe, and he asked the scribe, this is Jesus, asked the scribe, 
what question ye with them? So it's like after they've had this mountaintop experience, they're coming down to seemingly what is a huge commotion. And there are essentially three types of people here. You got, you got Jesus' disciples, you've got the multitude, which is the crowd, and then you've got the scribes. And what's interesting is that, of course, the scribes are there, and it says that they are questioning. They are questioning the disciples. And what we're going to unpack in these next verses is that the disciples are trying to cast out an unclean spirit, but here it is. They're not able to do it. They're not able to do it. And, and so they're questioning that, you know, the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, these are the critics of Jesus' ministry. The, these, these are the antagonists of his ministry. And of course, by proxy, the disciples are going to catch some of the collateral blow from being close to Jesus. So just like they're trying to discredit Jesus, they're trying to discredit his disciples. The, these followers, these learners, these pupils, these ones who would sit under the teaching of Jesus, they're trying to discredit Jesus by discrediting his disciples. And of course, you've got the multitude. Isn't it amazing how every experience we have in Christ, it seems like we always have a multitude there. People that are not necessarily invested in our experience, but they're just onlookers. And we would just love, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I would just love to go through trials and tribulations in isolation that that would be that would be very special you know because it would spare you so much embarrassment it would spare it you you know so much frustration but the reality is is that we always have a multitude because the truth of the matter is god is using the narrative of our lives in order to get this in order to produce faith in the lives of others sometimes we don't tell the story right so God's going to tell our story for us, and he's going to allow people to witness the story of your life. So they are witnessing, they're witnessing these scribes questioning, and they're witnessing these, these disciples who we're going to read about who are struggling to cast out these, cast out this demon. It says in straightway, straightway all the people uh, when they beheld him. I've got this word straightway highlighted because we're in the book of Mark, and this word straightway immediately, it, it's used 42 times in this in this book, a, a book that's a very short book, only 16 chapters, the shortest of all four gospels. And what is often uh, commented is that the book of Mark was written to a Roman audience. And because a Roman audience was very much a military type of uh, uh, a country, a military type of community, a military type of people, they, they had this very aggressive, very hastened type of personality. And here it is, Mark is moving from event to event to event in Jesus' life. And he's saying immediately and straightway. We're actually going to see this word three times just in this passage of scripture of Loam, and it's kind of it's kind of speaking to the speed of which things are happening jesus ministry though it was powerful only three and a half years and in much of what we read in scripture wasn't even the whole breadth of his ministry it was just windows and pockets maybe about six to eight months you know if you add it all together so it is it says straightway all the people when they beheld him it says that they were greatly amazed now i i wanted to point this out because in the union gospel press commentary it made a comment suggesting that maybe there was some residual from the jesus in the mount of transfiguration and this is what they saw and that they were amazed by kind of very similar to how moses was in Mount Sinai, and when he had spent time in the presence of God, when he came down, his face shone, and the people knew that he had been in the presence of God. I want to challenge that. I, I really don't believe that uh, they were amazed at the presence of Jesus for the fact that he had just been, uh, it, it had he had just transfigured. And the reason why I say that is because in Mark chapter nine, verse nine, it says that Jesus charged the three disciples that they tell no one what they saw until he were risen from the dead. So if, if Jesus was giving some type of clue as to what happened, it kind of would, uh, it, it would have defeated the purpose of him telling them not to say anything in verse number nine. Uh, so it, it is it is my perspective that they were amazed at Jesus because of Jesus's popularity. Every time Jesus showed up anywhere to do ministry, it was always a multitude. It was always a crowd. He always had uh, an audience. If I could use a, a, a very contemporary word, Jesus was viral at this point. His 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 reputation was viral. 
And many of these people are likely encountering Jesus for the first time. So you know how it is when you hear about a person, you hear stories, and it's just like at, at that time, you know, they didn't have things like social media, they didn't have Instagram, they didn't have YouTube, and a lot of these people may have never seen him before. So here it is, they're seeing this person that they heard about all this time, and they're amazed. They're, they're, they're shocked. They're running to him. They're, they're saluting him, which means they're just greeting him in a very customary way. And Jesus, already knowing that the scribes are there with bad intentions, he's confronting the scribes, and he's saying, what question do you have with these men, these my disciples? So Jesus is coming, and he's addressing the situation. So in verse number 17, it says, well, for 17 and 18, it says, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, it says he teareth him, and he foameth, and he gnashes with his teeth, and he pineth away. He says, And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And here's the tension in the text. They could not. They could not cast him out. Now, it's interesting because the, the fact that the disciples could not cast out this demonic spirit, that is mentioned in all three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all speak of this event that we're reading about in Mark 9. John didn't write about it, but the other Gospel writers did. And all of them highlight the fact the disciples could not cast it out. None of them, not not all of them highlight the interaction between Jesus and the scribes. None of them, all of them highlight the antagonist uh, posture of the scribes, but they do highlight the fact that, that the disciples could not cast it out. Now, one thing I want to say off the bat, because what the father is saying is he's saying that his son has a dumb spirit. And it, in the, the, the father is very clear in this that he is under the clear understanding and he's right for this for this particular event that the, the demonic spirit that that's on the inside of him is what's causing him to be sick this this what what he is dealing with is is uh some form of epilepsy it, it says it taketh him it teareth him he calls him to foam and gnash at his teeth and pine it away but i want to say something very clearly at the beginning of this you know uh sin and demonization are not necessarily things that produce sickness in our lives. Sometimes people can be sick. Sometimes good things happen. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Let's let's be clear. It, but the, sometimes you would read in scripture where there's a correlation between a demonic present and sickness, or sometimes people believe that maybe sin produces sickness. This is what the disciples believe in John chapter 9, verse 2, where Jesus healed the blind man, and, and the disciples asked him, who did sin? Did this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. This is for the glory of the of the, of the sons, so that people might know who I am. So it's like, they're, they're, and even Job, Job's, Job's friends thought that he had sinned, and that's why he was going through this very tragic trial, you know, of losing his family and his his home and all this stuff. No, I want to be very clear that sin and demonization don't necessarily always produce sickness. But in this case, this young man dealing with epilepsy, it was the result of this demonic spirit in Matthew 5 and 15 it called the young man a lunatic. In Luke 9, it said that he simply had a spirit. So it says that this spirit caused him to be dumb, which is speechless. Um, I would like to believe that he is able to create audible voices. We're going to read audible noises. Excuse me. We're going to read later on where it's going to say that the boy cries out. When it says crying out, it means in, in, in unintelligible language. You know, something is being said, but it's not clear. So when the young, so when the boy communicates, we cannot understand. It says that he takes him, which means that this spirit has more control over the boy than the boy has over the spirit. I wish I had time to deal with the fact that you know you are under a demonic tack when this demonic spirit causes you to do things without your consent. If anybody has ever witnessed someone who is demon possessed, they they usually make movements. They make bodily movements. They, they, they sometimes have facial expressions that are not human. I've seen cases where people were possessed by demonic spirit and you would look at their face and they look like they look like a cat or they look like something just just really 
uh, it's just really crazy, you know, something not human. Uh, the demons have the ability to, to, to change a person's appearance. They can cause them to do things out of their control. It says that the spirit take him. It says that it tears him. That that tears him, it means to rend. It means to burst or to break. It means to cause convulsions. I can imagine, again, more control over him than he has over the spirit. He's foaming. He's gnashing at the teeth. He's he's pining away. See, I, I really draw a heavy correlation to this young man and the demoniac that was in the grave that the man who called himself Legion, uh, because they said that this man was crazy and that he was, again, doing some of the same thing, foaming and gnashing at the teeth. Th these are all signs of a demonic presence. So the question you have to ask, you have to ask the question, why weren't the disciples able to cast this spirit out of this young man? And that's a fair question. It's a very fair question. Because what's clear in scripture is that Jesus had already given the disciples power over unclean spirits. The disciples had a right, the people had a right to expect the disciples to be able to cast this spirit out of this young man. In Mark chapter 3, 14 and 15, it says, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him, he being Jesus, it says, and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sickness. And then verse 15, it says, and to cast out devils. This is why Jesus called them and he ordained them so that they could preach, heal the sick, cast out unclean spirits. Mark 6 and 7, it says, and he called unto him the 12. It says, and he began to send them forth two by two and gave them power over unclean spirit. Verse six, verse 13 of Mark six, it says, and they cast out devils. They cast out many devils, excuse me, and anointed with oil, many that were sick, it says, and healed them. So it, it shows us very clearly in scripture, Jesus's intent, and then the accomplishment of that intent. So now here we are, fast forward from Mark six to Mark nine, and now we're asking the disciples to cast out an unclean spirit and they can't. Now that's challenging. That's why the scribes are questioning them. That's why the scribes are antagonizing them. And then you've got this, this multitude. So you can imagine, number one, the disciples are disappointed. The disciples are confused. The disciples are embarrassed. They, they, they're disappointed. They're disappointed in themselves. Minus the multitude, minus the scribes, they're mad at themselves. They're like, man, I should be able to do this. But then you add the crowd to it, it amplifies the intensity. And then you got the scribes calling them out. That makes them frustrated. That makes them mad. They're probably emotional at this point. You read later on in Mark chapter 9, well after this event, and the scripture talks about a particular man that is operating in the name of Jesus and he's casting out unclean spirits and the disciples try to rebuke him because he's not one of Jesus's disciples. It says in Mark 9 and 38, it says, and John answered him saying, master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name and he followeth not us. He's not one of your disciples. He's, he's, he's not a member of our church. He's not a part of our organization. And he's operating under the power of God. No, we got a problem with that. So it says, and we forbade him because he followeth not us. Didn't say he didn't follow God. <laughs> Just because he don't go to your church, you think he shouldn't be able to operate in the spirit of God. It says, and he followeth not us. But Jesus said, forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. In other words, Jesus was saying, look, if he's not against me, he's for me. So when you look at situations like that to add insult to injury, you've got people that are succeeding where you failed. Do, do, you, do you see what this position that the disciples are in? I'm, I'm illustrating all this because we have to identify with the disciples. 
we have to identify with the fact that there are times in our spiritual walk where we expect ourselves to be able to demonstrate certain power and for whatever reason, we fail to the, rise to the occasion. And it, it happens at some of the most inopportune times. We've got, we've got an audience, and not only do we have just a, an impartial audience, we've got a prejudiced audience. We've got our enemies out there, the people that you just really don't wanna be embarrassed in front of. And then you see some person across the way who's succeeding in places where you have failed. What, what is to be gleaned from this? There's, there's a lesson in this for us as contemporary believers. We need to observe this event with the life of the disciples. Number one, the first thing I want to point out to you is that past victory is not a guarantee of future victory. Can I say that? You may have had a mountaintop experience. And in that mountaintop experience, maybe some of you have experienced the gift of prophecy. Maybe some of you have experienced the gift of tongues. Maybe you experienced some supernatural experience. Maybe, maybe you just had supernatural peace. Or, or maybe you had some encounter, some event in your life where you were previously defeated and now you have victory. You've got spiritual power. And, and, and in your mind, you're like, this is the new tone of my life. It can be. That depends on you. But one of the, one of the best examples that I can think in scripture is Samson. In, in Judges 16 and 20, it says that he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He had become so carnal. He had played with spiritual matters so frivolously to the point that the Spirit of God was no longer empowering him and giving him supernatural strength, and he didn't even realize that the Spirit had left him. It says that he went to shake himself and didn't realize, I don't have power anymore. If we are not careful, as modern day Christians, we will find ourselves in the same place as Samson, whereas in one time we had power, we had strength, we had ability, and then we go to shake ourselves, and all of a sudden we are failing in places where we once had victory. Number two, we can develop and maintain our spiritual strength. Get this through devout spirituality. This is why the enemy tries to lust and try to stumble us as it relates to devotion. It's, it's amazing how challenging it is sometimes as a preacher and teacher to just talk about prayer and reading the word of God. It's a very hard, it's, that's a hard preach. I'm gonna be honest with you. You can stand up in front of the audience and you could talk about miracles and blessings. Listen, people will jump up and down. They'll run around the church. But as soon as you start talking about, you got to spend time in the face of God. When you start saying things, you got to spend time in prayer and studying the word. It's like you just suck the air out of the room. But don't you realize that the, that devotion is some of the most important cornerstones of the Christian life? With, with, without those things, we are not able to stand strong in the evil day. You will find that you have all these peaks and valleys in your walk with God because you're not consistent. Paul wrote in Ephesians 6 and 10, he said, finally, my brethren, he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Sometimes we get so comfortable and casual that we want to stand in our own might. And, and it's only through prayer, it's only through devotion, it's only through spending time in God's presence that we are able to remind ourselves of what we saw on the mountaintop. Look, it's not us. It's all about him. It is him that empowers us. So we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Last thing I want to point out is that spiritual gifts and special ability is not the goal. God is the goal. You know, we live in a day and time where people are just enamored with the concept of spiritual gifts. Everybody wants to be a prophet. Please understand, it's not about what title you have. It's not about the position that you have. It's, it's, not, it's not all about, you know, how you were used in this special way on this one particular occasion. Paul wrote in Philippians 3 and 10, he said that I may know him. That's all I want. Paul, Paul said, look, I, I was I was of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. 
He, he said he was a Jew amongst Jews. This man had accolades. And if you know the story of Paul, you know that he likely sat on the Sanhedrin court. This man had reputation. He says, I count that all as dung that I just may know Christ. He said, in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and be made conformable to his death. I don't want to know any of this wonderful stuff. I want to know God. And see, when your heart is in the posture where you say, look, all I want is God. God is the goal. Now, whatever experiences God allows me to go through in order to get there, I'm willing to go because I trust God. So this, somewhere along the way, we don't know the details. Somewhere along the way, there was a disconnect and the disciples are here in Mark 9 and they can't cast out the unclean spirit. Verse number 19 says, and he answered, say it, he, uh, said, and he answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? He said, bring him to me. He's talking about the son. Bring him to me. It says, and they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straight away, there's a second time. It says, the spirit tear him. It says, he felt on the ground and wallowed foaming. So all the stuff that they said that the spirit was doing, that this demonic was spirit was doing, he began to, he began to, to display it right here in front of Jesus. When Jesus says, and he answered him, he's saying that the scripture is reading in a way that says that he answered the father. But what he, who he's really talking to is the disciples. He's calling the disciples faithless. He's telling the disciples, how long shall I, shall I suffer you? That, that word suffer, it literally means to hold oneself erect or hold oneself up. It means to sustain or to bear, to endure. In other words, Jesus is like, I'm here, but I'm propping you up. And he's speaking to the time that he knows I am going to ascend in the glory. And there's going to come a time where you are going to have to stand on your own without me. The point of Jesus selecting disciples, we just read it, to give them the power to preach, the power over unclean spirit, the power to heal the sick, is so that they can continue in ministry without him. He's saying, but I have to suffer you. He says, you're faithless. So to add to all the intensity, listen, to the fact that they were disappointed in themselves, they disappointed themselves in front of an audience, Disappointing themselves in front of their enemies. You got people down the road who are doing things that they should be doing. But now God is disappointed. Listen, I don't know about you, but there's no, there's nothing that hurts my heart more in, in, in times in my life where I know that I've disappointed God. Disappointing myself hurts. Disappointing my family hurts. You know, disappointing people that you care about. That hurts. You know, embarrassing yourself in front of your enemies. It's like, man, I wish I could have that back. But to disappoint God, that that cuts that cuts deep, and He is expressing disappointment. He's you're better than this. I've I have given you the tools that you need in order to find success. We have to be in a place in our walk with God to where failing God makes us sad. Listen, if that is your motivation for walking in righteousness, to please God. If God is pleased, listen, I don't care what's going on in my life. Everybody else can be disappointed, but I need God to be pleased. It says that he called for the son. He said, bring him to me. And as soon as he brought him, it's straightway, again, we're talking about quick events. He starts to tear him and he's foaming at the mouth. So Jesus turns to the father and he says, he says, he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, as of a child, and oftentimes it had cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou can't do anything, have compassion on us and help us. This is a very challenging section of scripture right here. Because the father says that this demonic spirit has been attacking this young boy, it says, since he was a child. 
And what that leaves us with a very clear understanding is that even children are under the attack of the enemy. Now, I'm not blaming all bad behavior on, on, on demons. You know, sometimes children just act bad. Scripture says that a, a child born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Sometimes these, sometimes these children are just bad. I've worked in youth ministry for many years. Trust me, sometimes children are just bad. But then sometimes there's something deeper going on there. Sometimes these children are under a demonic attack. And, and if you are discerning, if, if you are spiritually sensitive, you know that some things that even children go through, listen, there's no, there's no amount of discipline that you can give them. Some things are spiritual and you have to use spiritual weapons. The weapons of our warfare are what? Not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So this is showing us that even children are under the, the, the attack of demonic influences sometimes. And what's challenging is, is that it's saying that this demonic attack is not just infrequent, it says oftentimes. My God, he is under constant attack. Sometimes we feel like we're just going through trial after trial and situation after situation, and here it is, this, this, this young son oftentimes catches the fire, tries to burn him, tries to drown him. It says literally tries to destroy. That literally means to demolish. It means to put to an end. For the enemy to come, what to steal, kill, and to destroy. I, I I have a question here because one thing that is very clear about demonic spirits and really any spirit for that matter is that it needs a body. the The Bible tells us that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. A spirit needs a body. But what's interesting is that. Not only does a spirit need a body, but one thing that is clear that you read in other passages of scripture is that spirits don't want to leave a body. Once they get in it, they want to stay there. You know, uh, uh, you know, anytime Jesus would encounter a demonic spirit, they they would begin to sometimes would run and bow down and worship him and say, Did you come to torment us before our time? And they would do things like don't cast us out. When Jesus was pointing speaking to the demoniac in the grave, they 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 immediately were like, if you've got to cast us out, let at least let us go to the swine. But it's interesting to think that they need a body, they don't want to be cast out, but here they are, they're 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 destroying this young man. He's, he's tearing him. He's putting him in fire and water. He's destroying the very body that, that in the reality that the spirit doesn't want to leave. Why would a spirit do that? You have to understand that the enemy has a goal for your life. The enemy has an intent for your life, and that intent is to destroy your life. Scripture says that when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And then what does the text say? It says when sin is finished, it says it brings forth death. That means that sin has a goal in your life. The devil has a goal for your life. And until the devil is finished, the devil doesn't want to let you go. Sometimes you wonder, why, why am I wrestling with this issue in my life? I've been trying to put this issue down for years, but why is it that I seem to struggle with it? Because the enemy is trying to destroy you. You've got to recognize a demonic attack for what it is. And see, what's amazing is like I told you from the beginning, this passage of scripture is about faith. It is about using the faith that God has given you access through through his word. And so oftentimes we want to use faith for, for very carnal things. We, we want to use faith to get cars and to get houses and stuff like that. And this is showing us that our faith, one of the primary uses of our faith is to have victory over the enemy. So this father asked Jesus, he said, help us. Help us. He said, if you can help us. And, I, and I'm just going to say this as we're going into verse number 23. Listen, anytime you see the word if in scripture, listen, the onus is not on God. It's on us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The if is on. There's no question whether or not God can help. So what does Jesus respond? He, Jesus said unto him, he says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. 
And straightway the father of the child cried out and he said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help thy my unbelief. So this word belief, it means to trust absolutely in God that he is able to give us or if we are able to obtain something that he is doing in our lives. There, there are many different forms of belief that we see through scripture. This particular one is a belief that you can receive exactly what you need from God. And somebody might question them and they might say, well, I've got things that I'm believing God for. And, and what is what is the key? What does it take in order for me to receive what I need from God? Well, first of all, you have to understand that you have to ask according to the will of God. You can't just ask any old random thing. Mark 14 and 36, it says, and he saith, I am a father for all things are possible unto thee. It says, take away this cup from me. But then he says, nevertheless. Not what I will, but thy will be done. This is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Even Jesus has to pray according to the divine will. Jesus' prayer, being fully God and fully man, being fully man, didn't want to die. Like, listen, this is the cross. But even Jesus' prayer has to be in a line with the will of God. And the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes people ask things from God, but they're not asking according to his will. James said in the book of James, it says that you ask, it says you do not receive. He says, because you ask according to your lust. We have to pray according to the will of God. So when he says, if thou can't believe, he says, all things are possible. All things that are what? According to the will of God. Now, what I love about the father's response, because the father's already asked one time to help. Jesus said, you got to believe. He comes back again, and he's asking you to help. But this time, he says, help my unbelief. I want you to understand, he's not necessarily expressing doubt right here. What he is expressing is that he's saying, I've come to the end of myself. Like, look, I've got faith in you. But I've got faith according to what I know. I know that you're a healer. I know that you're able. I know that you're the source and I'm coming to you. But he's saying, if there's anything else that I need at this point, I don't know what it is. And I need your help to make up the gap. And see, what, what I love about this father's response is the sincerity of it. I was moved because it says that this time he came to God with tears. Now, listen, I'm not in the impression that tears are some magic potion, but tears are a sign of sincerity. And so oftentimes, sometimes people come and they ask God for things and they're not sincere in what they ask because, again, they're asking according to fleshly desires. They're asking according, really, according to the hardness of their heart. Sometimes people are asking God for things and there are things that God has already instructed and told you to do and you're refusing to do what God told you to do and you're standing in clear disobedience. And then you still want to stand in front of God and be like, well, God, can you do this? There's a lack of sincerity there. But this man is sincere. He's got tears. And he's saying, look, I've come to the end of myself. Help me. Help my unbelief. So here it is. Jesus is, is hearing the testimony of the Father. And he's saying, it says, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, it says he rebuked the foul spirit saying unto him, thou dumb and deaf spirit. At first the spirit was just dumb. Now it's in a deaf spirit. He says, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And then the spirit cried, rent him sore and came out of him. It says, and he was as one dead in so much that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand it says, and lifted him up, and he arose. So this is the culmination of the miracle. This is the culmination of Jesus demonstrating his deity and the fact that he had power over an unclean spirit. It says, at this point, the multitude came. They were running. Likely, they were just trying to get a closer look at what was going on. And he began to speak to the foul spirit. He rebuked. It means to chide. It means to reprove. It means to censor severe. He commanded it. Thou dumb and deaf spirit, it says, come out of him. The cried, again, the cried 
is is an inarticulate cry. It, it is something that, again, he was dumb. The boy couldn't talk. So it was something that was un, unintelligible. It says that it rent him. He began to convulse the whole time. This young man is under attack. I want you to see what's going on here. So much to the point that when the spirit came out of him, it's, it says the boy looked as though he was dead. It, it was almost as though this boy did not know how to live life without a demonic spirit on the inside of him. Isn't that crazy? That that is way that is the way many of us were before we came to faith. The only life we knew was the life that was being animated through a demonic spirit. And when we got delivered, we didn't even know how to live life. We had to learn life all over again. It took Jesus taking us by the hand and lifting us up and showing us how to live life as a resurrected new being. So here it is, this, this young boy, he is delivered. I want to highlight this really quick because I'm, I'm swiftly running out of time. And I wanted to highlight because with this story, we are seeing different elements of demonic possession. And, and, and I would hate for us to take all of our cues as it relates to demonic possession from things like movies and, and things like, you know, sensational books, you know, because the reality is, is that the concept of demons and angels is is so big. And when I say big, I mean from an entertainment aspect of people just enamored by the concept of it. But this stuff is very real. It's got a very theological and biblical foundation. And look at this. Scripture says very clearly uh, uh, in the book of Ephesians chapter number six, it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Can I say this about when it comes to demons and the devil? Look, the earth is the place where the devil is the prince. Scripture says that he is the prince of the air. In, in, in one of the worst images that we have of the devil is that the devil is some red horned pitchfork having person in hell sitting on a throne. The devil's not in hell. The devil is the prince of the air. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places right here on earth. Understand hell is a place of torment for the devil and his angels. So we can't take our cues from comic books and from movies. We need to understand what it is that scripture tells us when it comes to demonic possession. Number one, spirits can go in and out of a person. I'm doing this quickly. Spirits can go in and they can go out. Number two, no matter how long you've been possessed by a demon dem demonic spirit, you can be delivered. That's what this text is showing. This boy had been delivered literally since he was a child. And Jesus has asked how long. It, he wasn't asking how long to say if it's long, if it's too long, it can't be done. No, no, it doesn't matter how long. The reality is, is that this demon is subject to the authority of God. So when we stand in the name of Jesus, we have power over demonic experience, demonic spirits. Demons may enter any person. Sometimes we have in our minds that some people are insulated from demonic possession. The only people that are insulated from demonic possession are believers that are sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you are vulnerable to the attack of demonic spirits. Number four, deliverance can be permanent or it can be temporal. I should say temporary there. When I say permanent, it's according to your walk at that point. There's a very uh, prominent passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 12, I believe, that it talks about when the spirit goes out from a man. It says that he walketh in dry places and that he goes and seeks at seven other spirits greater than himself. And then he comes back. And then if he founds the house clean and swept and unpossessed, it says that they will go back in to that house. So that's why Jesus made the commandment to this spirit. He said, leave him and don't enter him anymore. Why? Because unless he gave the command, there is a potential that the spirit can come back. So when you have been delivered from something, you need to go through the very devout uh, uh, practices of staying clean, staying righteous, staying holy. Verse, uh, verse number five in here, demonics, demons are aware and respond to the spirit of God. This is the hope that we have. Everywhere we read in scripture where Jesus encountered an unclean spirit, victory was given to Jesus. 
He had the power to cast out this unclean spirit. And even so, like I told you, you read later on in Mark chapter nine, there was another man who was operating in the power of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and had power over unclean spirits. We have power over the enemy in the name of Jesus. So the, the enemy, and if, and if you've ever been around somebody who uh, is being prayed for that that is um, that is possessed by an unclean spirit, you know that they are very responsive to the name Jesus. If you just simply say Jesus, they will begin to react. They'll begin to back off. Sometimes they, sometimes even if they're reactive, if you say Jesus, they'll, they'll kind of cower and go dormant a little bit. So the reality is, is that we've got power through Jesus over the enemy, but we have to stand in that power. So he says, he that seeketh dwelleth in the secret place, abide of the shadow of the almighty. You got to go where the ark of safety is. Verses number 28, 29, I'm out of here. I'm way over time. It says, and when he was come into the house, it says his disciples asked him privately, it says, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, these kind come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Can I say this real quick? Prayer is communication that is directed to God. It's, it's not just idle words. It's not vain repetitions. It's, it's, not, um, it's, it's not the desires of your heart that are spoken to vain places. When you pray, you've got to pray to God. And see, the reality is, is that the reason why so many people are powerless against the attack of the enemy is because we don't spend enough time talking to God. We talk to everybody else and everything else. You got to talk to God because it's in God's presence that we get a revelation of who he is and we get a greater understanding of our situation. Talk about that Mount Transfiguration. We get a revelation of who God is and our situation when we spend time in prayer. But then it says fasting. And some people, even some translations try to take this word fasting out. And that's nothing but the enemy. Because you have to understand how important fasting is. Fasting is when you uh, give up eating for a period of time, whether it's a partial fast and you give up everything uh, except water, or it's an absolute fast where you give up everything, including water. That there, there is, even in secular thought, they understand that it is the gut of man that drives him. That's why when you get ready to make a very important decision in life and you start asking people like, what should I do? And they'll say things like, what? Trust your gut. Because it, the, the will of man is oftentimes derived from his center. And what you are doing when you are fasting is you are suppressing your will. You are suppressing something that the body needs and you are suppressing flesh in order to give spirituality room. So Jesus is trying to give us the formula, get this, for maintaining the spiritual power that God has invested in our lives when we were on that mountaintop experience. You don't want to go from the mountain to the valley and then not be able to defeat the enemy. He says through prayer and fasting, you are able to maintain your strength. You are able to stand strong against the enemy, stand strong in the evil day. So what we have at the end of this lesson is we have Jesus demonstrating power over an unclean spirit. And through this, he is again illustrating his deity. He's illustrating the fact that he is not just the son of God, but that he is in fact God. Listen, that is our lesson for today. I pray, I hope something was said that can encourage you along the way. Listen, as we make our way out of here, as always, I do want to let you know Just Teach Ministries on several platforms, YouTube, Spotify, Instagram. Got a Podbean, which kind of pushes out the podcast to several peripheral platforms. So please uh, in, engage us as, as much as and often as you can. We appreciate the support. We appreciate the engagement. And please share with others. And also, Listen, if the Lord moved upon your heart, you want to be a financial support to Just Teach Ministries, listen, we've got things that God is leading us to do. And as they always say, look, it takes money for the mission. We appreciate those who are faithful supporters. Listen, I love you. I appreciate you. I pray God return it to your life, 30, 60, 100 fold, manifold blessings in the mighty name of Jesus. Listen, there are four ways that you can support us. There's the PO box on the screen, Cash App, PayPal. Super Thanks, which is an option through YouTube. I want to remind you as always, listen, 
the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And as it says there in 2 Corinthians 9 and 10, it says, he that ministers seed to the sower, he said he not only gives you food for your bread, but he says that he multiplies the seed that you sow. Listen, we appreciate you as always. We love you with the love of the Lord. This is the Union Gospel Press lesson. I do want to let you guys know, as always, listen, we go live with Just Teach Ministries every Sunday morning, 8.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. We're live on YouTube, Instagram, and uh, and Facebook. Excuse me. So if your schedule says so, please, by all means, come out. Be a part of our virtual audience. We appreciate the engagement. Listen, you might learn something, and you might teach me something. Come on. Come on Sunday mornings and teach the teacher. So, again, we love you. We appreciate you. We'll see you next time.